right, now I got sound. All right, now I got sound. Everybody can hear me now. Yep, now we got sound. Okay, all right. All right, so we're good. <coughs> Take this up here with me. Get my water with me. I think I got everything together. It'll be good to have Skip back and John back to help me out this today. I just wanted to uh, uh, say next uh, next Saturday uh, we're going to do a uh, a teaching on Passover, and I'm going to I'm going to go through uh, very shortly. I'm not going to take a full uh, a, a full time that it would take to go through the entire Passover Seder, but we're going to hit on the highlights of the Passover Seder. So if you've never been in this Passover Seder, uh, this is going to be educational for you uh and we're going but well, we're going to you know just uh very quickly go through it uh it takes normally it takes me about two or three hours to go through this thing so i don't want to do that that because i think that's laborious and uh a little bit much to do on a saturday morning when everybody's trying is hungry and want to eat so uh so i'm going to encourage you to bring a lunch with you i have a refrigerator just inside uh the other room there and you're able to, if you need uh, to refrigerate something, you're able to use the refrigerator there. Uh, so next Saturday, bring a bring bring a lunch with you, and that that that, that saves us from having to do a potluck. Uh, but just bring your own lunch for for yourself uh, and for your husband or whatever, uh, but uh, uh, or your wife if you happen to be the one that co that fixes the the meals. Uh, so that's what we're going to. That's what we'll do next Saturday, and we'll have some fellowship time afterwards. Uh, give give us some, give us some, get us to, to know each other. Passover, by the way, one of the things that that Passover is about is about gathering. Anyway, uh, God told Moses when it came uh, about, He said, "Gather the people together." And so, Passover is about gathering together. So that, that uh, we want to have a time of fellowship afterwards, uh, and answer any questions that anybody might have that uh, that comes up in the teaching of it. But I wanted to also uh, share a couple things with you. Um, I got I've been getting uh, some comments on our channel, and let me go down here to find my comments here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Um, this is someone who uh, who commented, and they said, "Happy New Moon Festival and Happy New Year! All that has breath, shout Hallelujah!" And uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's a person that has made. They've made several comments uh, on different videos. They're watching us on Rumble, and they are, I'm sorry, on YouTube, rather. They're watching us on YouTube, and they are, they, they uh, feel, they consider themselves part of the family. There's another one that he wrote where he actually feels like, he said, I, I feel like I'm, I, I, he said, uh, you know, greetings to, um, to my church family or something of that, that effect. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, then we have this lady uh, in, um, she's, she's actually in Germany. And let's see. Uh, she says, forever praise, thanksgiving to our beloved Adonai, Yahavah, Yahashua, Hamashiach, our only ruler, our only owner, our only savior, our only redeemer, healer, Alpha and Omega, Kings of Kings, Hallelujah, dear David, Happy New Year to you and your wife. May Yahweh bless, protect you, shine His face upon you, and give you shalom. And then she gave me some uh, some links of some things that uh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls and some some other things like that, which are is very interesting. Um, she's, um, I believe that she is from uh, from Germany, if I rem remember right. Let's see. Um so th these are these are people that are watching us online that are part they are part of our fellowship they they're part of who we are uh, 
and you know we we even had uh, we even had a lady from Poland actually uh, give a donation, and so uh, people are people are joining us, and they're they're part of our fellowship. So we I just want to say hi to everybody, hi to the people out there that are watching us uh, online. Uh, I know that we get new new wa new people every week that are watching us. Uh, we get new subscribers all the time on di different channels, so I'm just thankful for that. It's just uh, it's a good thing. Um, so today we're going to I'm going to talk about first fruits. I'm going to go through an explanation of what first fruits is. <coughs> so let's go over to Proverbs chapter uh, chapter three. Book of Proverbs, chapter three, and we're going to read verses nine and ten. Honor Yehovah with the with thy substance. Everybody, say this with me. Honor. I want you. I want you to want, listen. Watch what he says here. Honor Yehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. This honoring God with our first fruits. How can how do we honor God? What do we learn from first fruits about honoring God? What is it about first fruits that teaches us about honoring God? The first thing the first fruits teach us about honoring God is that we honor God with our best. We honor God with the best, the first of the fruits. The first fruits, the, the first fruits could be translated choicest fruits, the choice fruits. It's the first, it's the choice, it's the best of the ones. So we, so we learn to, to, we learn to honor God with the best of everything. So by taking the first fruits offering, and taking the best and offering that to God, we are we are learning how to honor Him in every other aspect. It's it's amazing how God uses money to teach us about spiritual things. Did you know that Jesus talked about money more than anything else in the in in the in all of His teachings? He taught it more about uh, more about money than He did salvation. He taught more about money than than. Than, uh, than sanctification, although those are important topics. But he spoke more about money than any other any other subject, because he used the he used money to teach us about spiritual things. And you can just read it over and over again. His parables, they, the, uh, many of them, you know, the lost coin, the the uh, the unjust steward, steward the, all all these different stories that he would tell, centered around a lot of times money. Because there's something about money that changes inside of you when you honor God with it. And so honoring God with first fruits teaches you how to honor God in other areas as well. The second thing that first fruits teach us is we honor God from our increase. To honor God, you honor God from your increase. What does that mean? That means as God has blessed you, you honor God by giving out of that blessing. You, that's how you honor him. That's how you recognize and you give him honor. You, you give him respect. You, you, you thank him for what you've done, what, what he's given to you. You honor him from your, from your increase. The third thing we, <coughs> we learn from first fruits is that the offerings need not be large. They don't have to be large. In fact, in in the barley harvest, which is the feast of first fruits, we have the feast of first fruits. You have the you have Passover, you have uh, unleavened bread, and you have the feast of first fruits. They they were they were to bring 
uh, a a uh, sheaf of barley, an omer of barley. Okay, that uh, it was a, about two quarts. So about two quarts of barley was the was the was the feast of first fruits. All right, but then we have the feast of Pentecost that's in in the summertime, the feast of Shabbat, and there they were to make two loaves. So this time, and it's called first fruits. That these two loaves are called first fruits, and so these two loaves now. So we went from we went from two quarts to two loaves, and then we find that when they would bring the first fruits to the temple, they would bring it in a basket. So it doesn't matter; it doesn't need to be large. It's not the amount that matters. The ma- the, what, what matters is that it's the best, and it comes out of your heart. Number four, <coughs> first fruit teaches us about honoring God because when we, when we honor his ministers, we are honoring God. When we honor his work, we're honoring him. When we give our first fruits into the things that God is is doing in our midst, then that honors Him. It brings honor to Him when we bring our first fruits uh, and we support the ministry with our first fruits. And number five, honoring God brings us closer to Him. Honoring God brings us closer to Him. The word for offering is the word Corban, Corban, and Corban literally means to draw near. So when we give an offering, we are expressing our desire to draw near to God. So when you give a first fruit offering, you're, you literally are expressing a desire to be closer to him. And he responds to that desire every single time. If you seek him, you will find him. If you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. If you begin to uh, to start the process and you give an offering, a first fruit offering, it you will literally draw. He, you, he draw it will draw you nearer to him. I've often linked giving with the amount of love we have for God. In fact, most people, their problem with giving is not that they do, don't have it or they can't afford it. Their problem with giving is that they don't love God, not to the extent that they need to. They haven't drawn near to him. They haven't learned that they can trust him. When you draw near to God, you you get into a trust relationship where you begin to trust him more and more and more. Oh, how I trust him more and more. Oh, tis sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. I forget the chorus now. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust thee. How I more and more. See how see how it works? When you begin to ex- extend a little trust, then you begin to trust him more. And then the more that you give, the more you trust, the more you trust, the more you give, and that increases your trust. Because you start to see him work out these things. It brings you closer to him. Those are, the. there may be other things, but I do know those things will do that. So honoring the Lord with our substance and with the first fruits of all our increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. That word first fruits there in Proverbs is the word reshit. 
first fruits can be is is the our English word first fruits is actually two Hebrew words. Sometimes it's used from reshit. Sometimes it's used from bikurim. I'll talk about bikurim in just a minute. First of all, I want to talk about the reshit. I don't know if reshit <coughs> stirs up your um, mind or not. <coughs> give me, give me just a second here. <coughs> So where have we heard this word reshit before? They may know. How about the first word in the Bible? Bereshit. The be in front of reshit there is a preposition that is attached as a prefix to the word reshit. And the preposition be means with, by, or in. So we take in the beginning and call it, and that's what we r translate Bereshit as, in the beginning. But it could have been translated this way. By, the bit part, Reshit, or by first fruits. By first fruits, God created the heavens and the earth. That's interesting. So let's let's look at the other word and let's let's look at something that is very telling about creation about what God did. See God gave first fruits at the very beginning before there was even you. And he did it and he created with first fruits. Who is first fruits? Yeshua is our first fruits, right? Paul tells us that. So with Yeshua God created all the uh, all the rest of all the world. Isn't that amazing? You see how the, it's uh, when you get into the Hebrew understanding, you realize that there's more than one meaning that can come out of the scripture as long as you stay with the underlying truth of what 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 the Bible is is talking about. As long as you don't deviate into some weird stuff here. <coughs> but the other word is that we use is Bikarim. And Bikarim comes from, is a plural form of the word Bakor. Bakor is the firstborn son. So a firstborn son is a type of a first fruit. Because he's the first fruit of your body. Are you following me here? And God specifically said the first fruit belongs to me. The first child belongs to me. The first male, uh, not child, but male belongs to me. Even of animals, the first animal belongs to him. It was the Bacor. Now, there were blessings that were tied to the Bekor. And guess what? There are blessings tied to the Bekorim. The Bekor gets a double blessing. The offering of the Bekorim carries a double blessing. They're inseparable. The first fruit is inseparable from the firstborn. The the in interesting is that the meaning is 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 just unbelievable. Now here's the interesting thing about the word bikurim. Bikurim can also be understood as meaning the promise to come. So a first fruit offering is a promise of more to come. And when you give a first fruit offering, you are saying, "I trust the Lord that there's more to come." They would tie off a bundle of the grain, and they would bring it to the temple, and that was to that was saying there's a promise of more harvest to come. There was more grain to be harvested, and God would promise them that there's more to come. That this entered into a, an agreement with God that has, He would then promise to bring more into their life.
Ezekiel 44, 30. Ezekiel 44, 30 says this. And the first of all the first fruits. Now here we have the first is the reshit, and the first fruits is the bikarim. So the reshit of all the bikarim. <coughs> And the first of all the first fruits of all things, and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblations, shall be the priest. You shall give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thy house. Listen, there is a blessing that will rest on your house when you give a first fruit offering. That's uh, Ezekiel 44, verse 30. A blessing... Rest upon your house when you give a first fruit offering. Look over at Romans 11, verse 16. Romans 11, verse 16 says this. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, this is talking about Gentiles coming in and, and how that they are now a holy people of God, just like the Israelites have been a holy people of God. And because, because we're, we are grafted into the vine, we're grafted into the tree, we're, we're grafted into the uh, olive tree. And so now, it, and so he, he's, he's taking this idea of first fruits. This is interesting because here we, here we are, Paul, and the, it's understood that the people understood what first fruits is, and he's applying the idea of a first fruit offering. He's applying that to the Gentiles, and he's applying that to the Jewish people. And he said, "If the if the, watch this, if the first fruit be holy." which they consider themselves a separate people, a holy people, then so are the branches. And what are we? We are the branches that have been grafted into the olive tree. And so the olive tree then is the first fruit, but we've been grafted in, and so we get the blessings of the first fruit. Exodus 23, verse 19. This is a, I love this scripture right here. <clears throat> Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of Yehovah your Elohim. Thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk or a, a, a baby, baby goat, okay? Now, the rabbis have taken that little verse and taken it completely out of context, moved it over here by its uh, side, and, and wrestled with this, this phrase, thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk, and they come up with the fact that they say you cannot eat cheeseburgers. You can't eat milk and meat at the same time. This is how they interpret this. <coughs> Nothing farther from the truth. In the context, if we keep this sentence, this phrase in the context, he's talking about first fruits. And what do you do with first fruits? You offer the first fruit, the first fruit of every animal. So what would the first fruit of, an an, of, a, of a goat be? It'd be a, the firstborn male goat of a female goat. And he's saying here, don't let, your desire to give a first fruit offering of the first of your goats overrule the compassion you have for the mother of the goat who is feeding that goat with her breast. What do we learn from that? We learn from that is that the first fruit is never to cause suffering for the person who gives it. The first fruit is not meant to impoverish you. The first fruit is not something you give when you can't afford it. It is something you give because you can afford to give it. And you give it cheerfully. 
<coughs> so don't cause pain with someone or yourself. Don't cause pain in the giving of the first fruit. I have heard preachers preach on first fruit offering, and my goodness, you know, by the time they're through, the, the poor people are over there just digging in their pockets, and they're just giving everything they got, and they, they, they don't even have any, uh, any, they can't even make their rent payment. That's not a first fruit offering. Now, tithe is a different subject, and, and tithing is separate from first fruits. Tithing is, is a separate thing, okay? Tithing is God's, God's part, okay? First fruit is a free will, out of your heart, gift. It is above the tithe. In fact, you can't give first fruits until you, after you give the tithe. It's not a first fruit offering if you don't give the tithe. Because you're taking money that should be the tithe and calling it first fruits. That don't even make sense. God knows the difference between a tithe and the first fruit, and, and regardless of what you call it, he knows the difference. <coughs> now, here's the interesting thing. That's Exodus 23, 19. If we go on to Exodus verse 20, 29 verse 20, uh, thir yeah, ver 23. I'll get it out in a minute. I just brushed my teeth, can't do a thing with them. Exodus 23, verse 20. So we're going to go on. After he says, The first of your first fruit of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way. Boy, just watch this. <clears throat> and behold, look, take notice. I want, you to, I want you to take notice of something here. I want you to look and see, I've sent an angel <laughs> before you to keep you in the way and bring you into the place which I've prepared. Boy, that ought to be a good place to shout right there. Beware of him and obey his voice. Now he's talking about Yeshua here, all right? The angel of, of the covenant. Provoke him not. For he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto your enemies. Praise God. Praise God. Be an enemy to my enemies. And an adversary unto my adversaries. He's going to fight my battles. For mine angels shall go before the, you and bring you unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. And you shall serve Yehovah your Elohim, and he shall bless your bread. And your water, and will take sickness away from the midst of you. There shall nothing cast their young nor be barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. I will send my fear unto you, and will destroy all the people to whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs unto you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before you. I will not, so you take care of demonic spirits is what he's going to do. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against you. By little and little I will drive them out from before you until you be increased and inherit the land. And I will set the bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest thou make thee sin against me, 
For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. So these, in this passage we just read from uh, verse 20 to verse 33, it talks about seven blessings of first fruits. Remember I told you that there was blessings tied to first fruits. Seven blessings. The first blessing is that angels walk before you. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> angels walk before you. They prepare the way before you. They clear the path for you to walk. They, they take on dangers before you get to them. They move obstacles out of the way before you even know there's an obstacle there. Blessing of first fruit. Second blessing of first fruit. Your enemy is God's enemy. You enter into a covenant with God that he then takes and takes your enemy as a personal enemy of his. Anybody who rises up against you, he will prove to be wrong. This is the heritage of the children of God. Every tongue that rises up to, to, to condemn you, he, he will condemn. Your enemy becomes his enemy. Somebody says something bad about you, you don't have to worry about nothing. God's got your six. He's got your back. And he will take care of it for you. Your enemy becomes his enemy. Whatever enemy that you are facing. Even the, de the demonic enemies that we face. <clears throat> the third thing. The third blessing. Our bread and our drink is guaranteed. Take no thought for what you shall eat or drink. For if the Lord takes care of the sparrows and the lily of the field, only take care of you, O oh you of little faith. You won't have to worry about your next meal. You won't have to worry about your next drink. Your water will be pure and wholesome. He will purify things for you. He will bring you bread and water. <clears throat> the next blessing, the fourth blessing, no disease. <laughs> I love that. The blessing of a first fruit offering is guarantee to you that God will take care of your diseases. Number five, no miscarriage and no infertility. Man, I don't know, most of you are well past the childbearing age. But there was someone some time ago that was telling me that, and I, don't, I can't remember who it was now, but somebody was telling me that they were believing that they, were, that they wanted a child and they hadn't been able to have one for, for they'd been trying for a long time. No infertility with a first fruit offering. It's amazing what a first fruit offering can do. Then number six. And this one will apply to most of us here. He will fulfill your days and give you a long life. In other words, he's going to give you fulfillment in your days. You will be fulfilled in your days. You're going to have a fulfilling life and a long life. He will bring you into a long, fulfilling life. All the way through to the end. And number seven, the last one. You'll have a fruitful life and you will possess the promises. With Israel, it was the land. With you, it might be something else. Whatever God has promised you, 
he will fulfill. Whatever he has promised, he is able also to perform. He who has begun a good work in you shall complete it. There is something about a first fruit offering that brings us into a relationship with God. We draw closer to him to where all of these things become part and parcel of our everyday life. So how do I know how much to give? Well, the first thing is you pray. It's amazing how many times prayer ends up on about the fourth or fifth thing that we do. <laughs> we need to pray first. It's our first fruit back to God. Prayer is a type of first fruit. We need to get, offer that first, the best of everything to him. So we pray about it. We pray and we ask him. We ask him, how much should I give? You might be surprised at the amount. It might be extra extraordinarily low and you would go, well, Lord, I'd like to give more than that. You asked me, I told you. It might be more than when you were thinking about giving. Whatever amount he says. I cannot tell you the times that my wife and I have thought about giving an offering somewhere, and I'd say, or helping someone. And I, she'd say, well, what do you think we should give? And I said, well, I kind of feel like this is a good amount. And she said, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's amazing how God speaks to both of you husband and wife together. So you pray. You pray and ask God to show both of you how much you should give. My wife and I just gave a first fruit offering. She said, what do, you, what do you think we should give? I told her. She said, that's what I had in mind too. So she added that amount to mine. <laughs> Is we just figured God was t telling both of us both of the same amount. It must must mean He wanted us both to give it. So she got she got her money and I got my money and we gave it. The second thing you need to so that you know how much to give is you prepare. So you pray. The second step is to prepare. Have a plan for what you're going to do with increase in your life. Have a plan for what you're going to do with God's increase into your life. Plan ahead of time and prepare to give. Number three, prioritize. Give the first portion. Give the best. Give the first portion. Number four, you give. In other words, you know the amount that you're giving or the per, uh, and, or the percentage, either one. You can do it on a percentage level. Lord, you know, I just I want to give I'm going to give two percent of, of what, what what comes in this this, this month. One percent, a half a percent. So, you know, the amount or the percentage, one of the two. You plan it. Number five. You repeat. You repeat. How often will I give? Many people give on the first of the month. Because it promises a month of, of supply for the rest of the month. Many people give when God increases them. You're never going to outgive God. So you 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 pl you plan you plan on how often you're going to give and make it a routine. Make it something you do every single time. Because once you get into the habit of giving, 
then you start, it, it, it starts multiplying itself, and God's blessings keep coming and keep coming in. Most of the people, they stop blessing because they start, they start eating their seed. I don't know if you've ever, uh, never did any farming or not, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things that the farmers would do back in, the, back in colonial America especially, they would, they, would have, they would have part of the crop that they would say, this is seed. They would put that aside because that's for the next crop for next year. If they ate their seed, there's no crop for next year. But by continuing getting into a routine, then you always have, you always have supply. What's important <coughs> is that you have an open heart and an open mind. The process of giving above your normal tithe can help prepare you for God to make a difference in your life. Have an open heart and open mind. Give the best. I don't know if I mean, y'all know the story of Cain and Abel. It says over there in Genesis that Cain brought some of the crop. But Abel bought the first he bought the first fruit. He bought the bacor. He bought the first one of his crop, the choicest of this of his flock. This is not about the offering. It's not about whether he gave a blood offering or a uh, or a uh, grain offering because both offerings are acceptable in 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 the offering. Uh, the fi there's five different offerings, and one of them is a grain offering. So God, grain offerings are acceptable, but it wasn't acceptable because Cain brought some. He just went out there and got a little bit of handful here, threw it, threw it over there at God. But Abel brought the best. So he brings the best. Now here's an interesting thing about, and we're going to close with this, but Deuteronomy 26 and you can find that Deuteronomy 26, verse 1. And we're going to read through verse 11. <clears throat> but when they would bring the first fruits, and they would bring their first fruits in a the basket, they would walk up to the, to the priest and they walk up to the temple. And please, you don't have to bring me the first fruits. You can deposit it back there, or you can put it into, uh, into the, uh, uh, you can do it through the uh, telephone, or you can, you know, the texting, or you can do it up from online on our website. <coughs> but they would bring it to the priest. They would bring their basket to the priest. And they would give the basket to the priest. Now, this is interesting. Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. <coughs> and it shall be when you come into the land which Yehovah, your Elohim, has given you as an inheritance. And you possess it and dwell in it. Just make <coughs> and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of your ground, which you shall bring from your land that the Yehovah, your Elohim, has given you. So he didn't specify amount. He just said, Get the, bring the choicest of it, the first of it, but just bring some of it. You don't have to, you know, there's no certain amount. Just bring some of it. So the first of the produce of your ground, which you shall bring from your land that the that uh, Yehovah, your Elohim, is giving you, and put it in a basket, and go to the place where Yehovah, your Elohim, chooses to make his name abide. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today that ye have all your Elohim, that I have come to the country which ye have all swore to our fathers to give us. This is interesting. 
because he he says, I declare today that you have to Yehovah your Elohim. So what is he saying here? He's saying in fact the, the, the Hebrew is, is actually I have already declared it. It's actually, this is actually not a good translation. It should be, I have declared. I have declared. So when did he declare it? If he's now saying, I have declared, when did he, receive, when did he say he, re, he declared it? By coming. By his presence. Now he is saying what his presence has already said. His him coming and and bringing the basket was a declaration. It was a declaration. Listen to this. It was a declaration that they had already come into the land. In other words, it was a declaration that God had fulfilled His promise. Think about this for a minute. Moses did not get to enter into the tra uh, to, to the promised land. Abraham did not see this day. He would not did, did not see, he saw it in, in a vision, but he didn't see it in person. But this man gets to stand there because of what those men did. And he is the witness saying that God's promises have come to pass. So I have declared. How did I declare it? Because I'm here. Why do the Jewish people say, Am Israel Chai? The people of Israel, Am is people. Israel, Chai is live. The people of Israel live. Why? Because that their presence in the land shows that God was faithful, that in one day they became a nation. That they in one day they have returned back from their captivity, that God has brought them back. Their presence declares that. And so they proudly stand and declare, I'm Israel Kai. I'm here. And God has promised us to be here, and he also promised to never take the land away from us again. That's why they stay there in the midst of all this battle. So by the presence, by their presence, they're saying, you've fulfilled your promise. When we bring our first fruit, we are stating with our bodies as we bring it. Lord, you have fulfilled your promise to me and to my forefathers before me. <clears throat> then it says this, goes on. Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And watch this. And you shall answer and say before Yehovah your Elohim. Answer? Answer what? I didn't hear a question. How can they answer if there is no question? Ah, but there was a question. And the question was, when the priest took that basket and said before the uh, of Lord God, the unspoken question was back to the person who brought the basket. God is saying, how do I know? How do I know that, the, that you understand the promise, that the promise has been fulfilled? I know you're here, but how do I know that you understand it? And so he answers God, and he says this, <clears throat> My father was a Syrian about to perish. And he went down into Egypt and dwelt there, few in number. And there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to Yehovah Elohim of our fathers. And Yehovah heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. 
So Yehovah brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with a great terror and with great signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, look, <laughs> I have brought the first fruits of the Lamb unto you, O Yehovah, that you have given me. Then you shall set it before the Lord your, Elo uh, your Elohim and worship before the Lord your God. So you, you shall rejoice in every good thing which Yehovah your Elohim has given to you and your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. You see, God, I do understand. I do understand. I understand that you brought me out. You brought me out of the miry clay. You set my feet on the rock to stay. I understand that you are a promise keeper. And that you have promised me to this day, I would not be this far had you not brought me here. I was simply wallowing in the mire had it not for you lifted me up. I remember the day of the canker worm. I remember what you brought me through. I remember what you brought me out of. And I'm offering this because I'm saying you are a promise keeper. And I know this bickerim is a promise of more to come. It is an act of of your faith in Yehovah that he will provide for you every single day. It is above the tithe, but it is a great way of getting close to him. If you haven't begun to give a first fruit offering, next week we're going to go again the uh, going to be doing the Passover. Might be a good time for you. I don't know. We should come to the feast days and don't come on empty handed, he told us. So it might be good to get a first fruit offering. Well, David, I don't have much. It doesn't have to be much. Bring a penny. I don't care. God doesn't look on the amount. He looks on your heart. The widow threw in two mites. It was her. It was everything she had, but she put her whole self into it. It's not the amount. It's how much you put into it. It's how much heart and how much love and how much trust you put in with the offering. If it's a penny, it'll be enough. A little as much as God has in it. There was one time over in the, in Kings where they uh, they had uh, poison in the pot, and Elisha. This is Elisha. Said, uh, "Put some fl flour in the pot," and the pot was in. And they, they were they were fine. But there was a famine in the land during this time. And Elisha had the his prophets, his school of the prophets around him. And a man come by and I can't I'm trying to think of his name. He was he didn't give his name, but he gave a place that he was from. But I'll, I'll maybe sometime I'll get into this a little deeper. But he he brings this man brings a first fruit. It says he brought a first fruit offering. In the middle of a famine, he brings a first fruit offering. And he gives it to Elisha. And somebody and Elisha says, "Share this with everybody." And the guy says. There's not enough. 
There's not enough to feed everybody. Elisha said, do it anyway. And everybody got fed and there was left over. You may not know, understand or even know how God will multiply your small gift to do more than you could possibly ever imagine if you didn't give anything. It's not the amount. It's not the amount. Little as much if God is in it. God can multiply. He can multiply it. He can make it stretch when there's when it's not enough to even meet the need. He knows how to make it work. Believe you me, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or even think. Let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. Yibarakaka Yahweh Vish Malaraka Yair Yahweh Pana Velaka Vikraka Yisa Yahweh Pana Velaka Vishem Laka Shalom The Lord will bless you and he will keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you, and he will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift his countenance upon you, and he will give you peace. Amen. Amen.